Hey guys, Brock Showed here. Back with you with the next video in our series, The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Without further ado, returning to The Great Gatsby. Her family is one aunt about a thousand years old. Besides, Nick's going to look after her, aren't you, Nick? She's going to spend lots of weekends out here this summer. I think the home influence will be very good for her. Daisy and Tom looked at each other for a moment in silence. Is she from New York? I asked quietly, quickly. From Louis Louisville. Our white girlhood was passed together there. Our beautiful white... Did you give Nick a little heart-to-heart -heart talk on the veranda? Demanded Tom suddenly. Did I? She looked at me. I can't seem to remember. I, but I think we talked about the Nordic race. Yes, I'm sure we did. It sort of crept up on us. And first thing you know. Don't believe everything you hear, Nick, he advised me. I said lightly that I had heard nothing at all. And a few minutes later, I got up to go home. They came to the door with me and stood side by side in a cheerful square of light. As I started my motor, Daisy peremptorily called, Wait! I forgot to ask you something, and it's important. We heard you were engaged to a girl out west. That's right, corroborated Tom kindly. We heard that you were engaged. It's libel. I'm too poor. But we heard it insisted Daisy, surprising me by opening up again in a flower-like way. We heard it from three people, so it must be true. Of course, I knew what they were referring to, but I wasn't even vaguely engaged. The fact that gossip had been published, the bands that, that the fact that gossip had published the bands was one of the reasons I had come east. You can't stop going with an old friend on account of rumors. And, on the other hand, I had no intention of being rumored into marriage. Their interest rather touched me and made them less remotely rich. Nevertheless, I was confused and a little disgusted as I drove away. It seemed to me that the thing for Daisy to do was to rush out of the house, child in arms, but apparently there was no such intentions in her head. As for Tom, the fact that he had, that he had some woman in New York was really less surprising than that he had been depressed by a book. Something was making him nibble at the edge of stale ideas as if his sturdy physical egotism no longer nourished his preemptory heart. Already it was deep summer on roadhouse roofs and in front of wayside garages, where new red gas pumps sat out in pools of light. And when I reached my estate at West Egg, I ran the car under its shed and sat for a while on an abandoned grass roller in the yard. The wind had blown off, leaving a loud, bright night with wings beating in the trees and a persistent organ sound as the full bellows of the earth blew the frogs full of life. The silhouette of a moving cat wavered across the moonlight and turning my head to watch it, I saw that I was not alone. Fifty feet away, a figure had emerged from the shadow of my neighbor's mansion and was standing with his hands in his pockets regarding the silver pepper of the stars. Something in his leisurely movements and the secure position of his feet upon the lawn suggested that it were Mr. Gatsby himself come out to determine what share was his of our local heavens. I decided to call him. Miss Baker had mentioned him at dinner, and that would do for an introduction. But I didn't call to him for he gave a sudden intimation that he was content to be alone. 
He stretched out his arms toward the dark water in a curious way. And far as I was from him, I could have sworn he was trembling. Involuntarily, I glanced seaward and distinguished nothing except a single green light, minute and far away. That might have been the end of a dock. When I looked once more for Gatsby, he had vanished and I was alone again in the unquiet darkness. Chapter 2 About halfway between West Egg and New York, the motor road hastily jo joins the railroad and runs beside it for a quarter of a mile, so as to shrink away from a certain desolate area of land. This is a valley of ashes, a fantastic farm where ashes grow like wheat, into ridges and hills, and grotesque gardens where ashes take the forms of houses, and chimneys and riding sm rising smoke, and finally, with the transcendent effort of men who move dimly and already crumbling through the powdery air. Occasionally, a line of grey cars crawls along an invisible track, gives out a ghastly creak and comes to rest and immediately the ash gray men swarm up with leaden spades and stir up an impenetrable cloud which screens their obscure operations from your sight but above the gray land and the spasms of bleak dust which drift endlessly over it you perceive after a moment the eyes of dr t j eckelberg the eyes of Dr. T. J. Eckelberg are blue and gigantic. Their retinas are one yard high. They look out of no face, but instead form a pair of enormous yellow spectacles which pass over a non-existent nose. Evidently, some wild wag of an occultist set them there to fatten his practice in the borough of Queens, and then sank down into eternal blindness, or forgot them and moved away. But his eyes dimmed a little by many paintless days under sun and rain, brewed on over the solemn dumping ground. The valley of ashes is bounded on one side by a small foul river, and when the drawbridge is up to let barges through, the passengers on waiting trains can stare at the dismal scene for as long as half an hour. There is always a halt there of at least a minute, and it was because of this that I first met Tom Buchanan's mistress. The fact that he had one was insisted upon wherever he was known. His acquaintances resented the fact that he turned up with popu popular restaurants with her, and, leaving her at a table, sauntered about, chatting with whomsoever he knew. Though I was curious to see her, I had no desire to meet her, but I did. I went up to New York with Tom, on the train one afternoon, and when we stopped by the ash heaps, he jumped to his feet, and, taking hold of my elbow literally, forced me from the car. We're getting off, he insisted. I want you to meet my little, my girl. I think he'd tanked up a good deal at luncheon, and his determination to have my company bordered on violets. The supercilious assumption was that on Sunday afternoon, I had nothing better to do. I followed him over a low, whitewashed rail railroad fence, and we walked back a hundred yards along the road under Dr. Eckelberg's persistent stare. As usual, we'll go ahead and stop there for this week. I want to say thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Please like, comment, and subscribe, as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all, take care, and thanks again.